Hey, you're listening to Film Link, the podcast where we take different films and discuss their link. I'm Jeremy Levine. And I'm Jason Melanson. And on this premiere, the first Ooh. episode of our podcast, we'll be discussing the link between 1974's Castle of Sand and 1979's Vengeance is Mine, both Japanese films dealing with murder so what what's going on man how's your uh how's your film your film watching well, journey's been going recently well earlier today after watching two very depressing movies that we watched i wanted something more life affirming so i watched pauline at the beach i saw you'd watch that that's one i haven't seen but that's romer right yep yep that's eric romer's film from 1983 it's part of his comedies and proverbs series or cycle okay. that he did which mm -hmm. is basically just kind of lighter versions of what he was doing with the six moral tales right okay and it was and this this series was six as well uh yep yep this one was six as well then he did a third cycle which was like the four seasons obviously that was only four but yeah pauline at the beach man every time i watch it i'm like this is my favorite romer and that's how i'm feeling right now because it's the one that yeah. i think it's not his like deepest or anything like that, but it's the one where I feel like I walk away from it feeling like I know the characters the most. Right. And it's also the lightest and the breeziest and like the <laughs> most laid back. And that's half the reason, half the reason I go to Romer's for like complex character stuff. <laughs> the other half is just, I want to see these beautiful locations and people just kind of going around living life. There's if it like fills, fulfills both of those. Sure. So, and this one I think hat hits the balance the most, but then again, I, then I, then I watch Claire's knee and I'm like, that's my favorite. So I, I don't really know. But yeah, well, that's, well, that's the sign of a, you know, that's the sign of a favorite, right? Sign of a favorite filmmaker usually oh, where you can't, sure. you know, you can't usually, you can't decide. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's, I mean, for me, like someone where it seems almost obvious, like, Kubrick you know if you ask me but definitely my stock answer is it's 2001 and I think that's yeah. probably correct that that is my favorite but I mean when I watch any of the other movies you know like like the one I watched most recently was Full Metal Jacket and I mean as soon as it ended it was just no this is his best movie this this one <laughs> this, yeah I, this is this is the best Kubrick. <laughs> Specifically that third act with Full Metal Jacket. Sure. Eyes Wide Shut is the only one that makes me actually question 2001. Because 2001 would be my pick as well. Mm -hmm. When I watched Eyes Wide Shut, I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm like, I think 2001 I admire more. But then while I'm watching Eyes Wide Shut, I'm like, this kind of really hits everything I want in a film. Sure. But then and I watched it, 2001 again and it's like, oh, no, no question. It, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's just the, I mean, just the ambition of it alone and the, it's, I mean, to, you know, speak and not to speak in cliches about that movie, but I mean, it is genuinely awe-inspiring when, when you watch it, mm -hmm. you're, you're just like, I've, you know, I mean, to this day, I mean, it hasn't been duplicated, right? Like people try, <laughs> you know. Oh, um, yeah, for any, sure. Any, any, anytime some, you know, anytime some serious-minded auteur is, is going into space, I mean, they're at least looking at them a little bit you know in the rear view mirror at least slightly they're at least glancing somewhat at it you know for sure and um, the fact that it's always the next 2001 and it's never the next the last film that was the next 2001 tells me that there hasn't been a next 2001 yet like like as much as i love it you know they're not going to be saying uh in 10 years i won't be saying this is the next ad astra you know yeah exactly <laughs> in a way the closest was maybe solaris because sure. it was kind of made in response, but it's so different that you kind of can't, it, or you almost have to have a next Solaris. Mm. Because he was, it was kind yeah. of going against 2001, from what I Sure. Understand. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, uh, Tarkovsky hated it. 2001. You can, yeah. you can see why when you watch Solaris, there's a very, it's, it's almost like he throws away the sci fi to focus on the human aspect. Like he, yeah, it feels like he's setting up a different film than what you get, and that's the like that's what's great about it. Yeah, for sure, and I and I think you know for him, um, there you know there, like because I know he wasn't a big fan of Antonioni, 
And I don't know how he felt about Kubrick outside of 2001, mm. but I'll, I'll just go on the assumption that he probably overall didn't care for him. I think he, I think there's something about these filmmakers that he probably viewed them as, you know, secular, like, like Antonioni. Oh, okay. It's all, it's, there's really no spirit. What in his perception, I think he would probably think there's no like spirituality there. There's no real. So because they lack that spirituality in his mind, he probably feels like they're not getting at what, it really means to be human what the kind of lived oh, okay. experience of being human really is oh, okay I, that explains I why he likes bergman so much too yeah absolutely I, that's exactly I, what bergman focuses on yeah and and i don't necessarily agree with that but i understand what he means i oh, yeah you know and in <laughs> fact i i think and, and i think i think his way of looking at it especially in the case of antignoni you know i, I almost think that lack that he's probably referring to is very present in Antignoni, but I think it's probably intentional. Yeah. You know, like, well, like especially think, in like, La Note. Yeah. Like I think that's part of the point of these films is that mm -hmm. th these people don't have faith in anything. It's not, it's not even think it's meant to be yeah. religion necessarily. Like, I don't even know if Antignoni has any like, like if his view on it would have been, oh, ever since we lost religion, look at the state we're in. I don't even know if that is necessarily where he's coming from, but he does seem to feel that modernity doesn't have a a, a sense of, of of meaning anymore for people. And this is in the you know nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies that he's making these yeah, films, for sure. like you, kind you... of most profound films. And you really feel that now. I mean, oh I mean, yeah, people people are literally going insane right now because of this. It's driving people mad. Like like the fact oh, you know sure. like it's it's it you know. So I think you know he was really. I, I I find his his films to be quite um, they hold up really well, even though on the one hand they do seem very much of their time, like just the kind of stylistic elements are very. Although it sounds funny, I mean I say his the stylistic elements are very kind of sixties European art film, but I mean Antonioni basically wrote the fucking book on it. Yeah. you know what I mean. Like, and he, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think it's one of those things too where it's it's so specific to the time mm -hmm. and to the technique and the style that it becomes universal mm -hmm. because he's able to go full force into it. And what you're saying about um, without like them not having that foundation, I think that's kind of yeah the point of especially that trilogy. Although I haven't seen the third one, um, the first two anyway, is that like without that basic foundation, there's sort of a world weariness and the films kind of drift in and out of a narrative that kind of reflects the, how the characters feel. Well, with where they have nothing to attach on to. Well, with Le Ventura, especially, I mean, that's literally what that movie's about. It's mm -hmm. about the lack of meaning. It's about, we, as an audience member, we literally don't know what the meaning of this movie is. Like once the woman disappears... And it's yeah. obvious they're not going to find her. And at a certain point, it doesn't even seem like they're really looking for her anymore. Yeah, and it becomes then, more and more and, of a backdrop and, and as the, the film it, goes. It, 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 the, the film becomes unmoored and it it, it, it just kind of gets almost cut adrift. And yeah, like there's almost like, it's like there's a feeling like there's nothing to grab onto. And, and that one's interesting though, because in a weird way, he almost does come down on a solution that i mean the film's almost hopeful because yeah at the it, very because, very because, end because at the end he almost seems to suggest that the meaning the only real meaning can be found in our interpersonal connections with other people yeah in and, interpersonal and, connections and, yeah with else. And, you know which is almost uh you know for all the radicalism of that film and 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 of a lot of the ideas of that film, it's almost a very square kind of uh, 
uh, resolution, right? It's, I mean, you not to be flippant, but it, it's all, yeah, it's almost a, like love conquers all. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah love of. is the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but like, it doesn't feel like that. No. When you're, like when you're saying that, I was like, you know what? That I guess that kind of is what's going on. And I think the reason it doesn't feel like that is because you're so, you really are so attached to that basic plot, yeah. like that that her going missing yep. and it's weird it's one of those films where the the macguffin is the plot oh 100 so you want to get to the the main discussion now the the featured films sure i guess you've i guess i've been uh rambling on long enough we can we can now everybody can listen to us ramble on about these about the films that they're all listening in to hear us ramble on about. yeah exactly it'll be no different except for that this is in the title <laughs> exactly uh yeah so okay so Okay, before we get into the main discussion, we'll kind of go through like our opinions of the movies real quick first. So yeah, first up was uh, actually as a, like a quick little thing. So when we came up with this, you were trying to find a film to match with Vengeance is Mine, which right. we had both seen and we're both fans of. Mm -hmm. But I don't think either of us had seen for a bit. Is that I hadn't? That's true. I hadn't. Well, I because I I had told you that I was planning to rewatch it soon. Yeah, and and so I had just kind of mentioned it offhandedly, and then I thought, oh, that would be a good one to talk about. And then you mentioned Castle of Sand, which was a movie that when I had the Criterion Channel, that's where we watch these movies. Yeah, uh, um, I have access to it again, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh I, i'm sure it's fine to say i'm oh you, yeah for sure you're I'm letting just, you're I'm letting sure some you're, handsome man you're letting you use it. you're you're yeah you're you're letting me use your login yeah. um only for this, this though not out of the kind this, of my heart this is this is what but this is where we watch the movies yeah. but i was saying that i had watched castle of sand or i'd started watching it but i only got like 20 minutes in and then i didn't have the criterion channel anymore and it's a hard film to see outside of that yeah so yeah so I just never got the chance to follow up on it, but so I was glad for the opportunity to um, to check it out. Okay, so the two films, uh, so it's Castle of Sand, nineteen seventy four, Vengeance is Mine, nineteen seventy nine. Mm -hmm. um, Castle of Sand, and, and who's that director? Probably pronouncing it wrong, but it's like Yoshitaro Nomura. It's N O M U R A. Okay. Um, and he's great. He's a great filmmaker. I've seen quite a few of his movies I, now. Uh, this is only the second one, but I'm curious to see more. Um, I definitely preferred the other one, Demon. Yeah, and the, I think I think this Castle Sand is kind of more in key with his other films, honestly. Oh, okay. Um, but there's there's definitely some common elements in a lot of them. He ends his films in a certain kind of way, and it really shows in this one specifically. Um, it it's basically a murder investigation. Uh, yeah. There's an elderly man who's unidentified who, you know, he gets murdered in Tokyo. The police don't even know his identity. Um, they have no leads. And the film is basically just the investigation that eventually leads them to discovering, you know, the identity of the victim. Eventually, the you know, they, they develop a, a suspect and... I guess to not get yeah basically uh, it's just it's just a police procedural where they don't really have anything to work with at first yeah it just as the film goes they kind of they it will really plays into the process of of trying to find clues it's a lot of train uh, rides uh, a lot of people sitting around bored waiting for uh, lab results to come back up up to a point we will get into it when that we get into the yeah. discussion proper but sure. it does take a strange direction um so. I enjoyed it. I think it was, uh, yeah, I, I was a fan. Um, it, it's, it's the kind of movie I, I would, I would kind of have to, I, I'm almost undecided about okay. the end, you know, like it, it it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, um, it's definitely I, interesting. I, I, I like, you know, I, I like where his head's at. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I, as soon as I saw it though, I thought when it gets into that last 40 minutes, I thought, oh yeah, it's a total fucking Jeremy movie. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I immediately, that's what. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's what made me like love it. <laughs> yeah. And, I, I, and on a second watch, I felt the same way. That last 40 minutes is what I just fucking love that. And yeah, we'll get into that more. But uh, 
Yeah, so you thought it was pretty I, good I liked overall, it, and, and I didn't even dislike the last 40 minutes. It was more of a thing where I think I was maybe just a little bit undecided. And we can get into it when we discuss yeah. it more in-depthly, but I... Oh, I, for sure. Uh, there's, yeah. like, potential issues I might have with it, but I think... But I'm hoping maybe in us discussing it, you'll perhaps clarify some things that'll you know, cohere a little bit more for me, but definitely interesting. Very, uh, very, very, very interesting yeah. and, and bold, a very kind of bold. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and this, and the second film we'll be discussing is uh, Shohei Imamura's uh, Vengeance is Mine from 1979. And this is basically a manhunt film to a certain extent, um, like a early serial killer film, even you might say, but yeah, it's it's basically it's basically about this guy. Um, and I mean, at the time these crimes are taking place, like they probably had some of the language of serial killers, like at the time the movie was made, but at the time it's set, because um, it's a historical film. Yeah, um, it's 1963. The, or kind of goes all over the place but the majority of it's 63 64 it takes place over like a, was it a 78 day, 78 day man um, yeah loosely inspired by a, a true story yeah we'll put it that way and uh and i, I love this film like this film is like oh, like yeah. this like it's funny that when we say and we'll get into this in more detail as we discuss but when i say watching that film especially the last 40 minutes of castle of sand i thought oh this is a jeremy movie I mean, I think just watching the amount of perversity and depravity on display in Vengeance's mind, you probably thought, oh, yeah, this is a fucking, this is a real Jason flick right here. I didn't just think it was a Jason flick. I thought it was like, you probably related to it on a very deep level. <laughs> yeah. You thought, this, this is, is me. me. Yeah, this is really, I mean, it's really an uplifting story about a man discovering who he really is. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Despite the obstacles. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, so those are basically the films in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Well, real you know, quick, I, I want to say that I, I, I've always really liked Vengeance is Mine. On a second viewing, I fucking loved it. Um, I, between the two, you obviously like Vengeance is Mine more. I, I probably agree as a whole. Mm -hmm. But I think that that last forty minutes of Castle Sand is something else. But yeah, um, yeah. And well, um, I guess we'll say we'll say spoilers now. We're gonna spoilers. Get into the yeah, we're gonna get fuck it. Yeah, get it. Get into the get into the meat of it. So, I think I think uh, I, you know since we're trying to contrast and compare these films, I think um, I actually think a good place to start is so there's a real kind of humanist impulse to Castle of Sand that is definitely absent uh from vengeance's mind uh vengeance's mind is is much more you know cynical it's it's uh i feel like with vengeance's mind it's it's that the the disasters are inevitable and with castle of sand it's that the disasters are preventable it has a, like an element of hope like we can move sure. forward from this this is what how things have sure. been sure we can move forward and vengeance's mind is just a portrait of just I think like a structure that's broken. It's just broken. shit. Everything. Sh it's every, just shit. Everything it's garbage, is yeah. shit. And and <laughs> yeah. it's you know. And I think there's probably a sense of morality to Castle of Sand, whereas I think uh, Vengeance's Mind is probably a little bit amoral in that way. Because oh, there there is a, there's even an aspect of Vengeance's Mind because the society is depicted as being so. Um, kind of debased and rotten to begin with that I, I mean I wouldn't quite go so far as to say Imamura is glorifying this guy because he's not I, I definitely don't think that's, no, that's I don't the think case no. but uh, I, you know he doesn't he only maybe seems like marginally worse than some of the other people even yeah, though he, th even though he murders five people uh, yeah i think it's like what if you take this kind of sociopath nihilistic figure and you put him into the society that's kind of it's kind of crumbling around mm -hmm. him like the the government is kind of failing right. them the, the religion aspect of it like religion is failing him and his family unit is broken yeah and like, there's there's not an explanation for why he does the things he does, but the closest you get is a flashback, and it kind of taps into all three of those. You see him losing faith in like the government, 
the religion and right. his father. And I don't think that's why he, because the way he handles that is he attacks the, you know, the, the guard. Uh, I don't even know what he it's, is. It's, yeah, it's, or he's a soldier. It's it's basically the. <clears throat> it's just Military. before. It's just pre World War II. So by this time, this would have it's 1938. So Japan would have invaded China already, and they were engaged in conflict there. And it was and again, it's just pre World War II. And yeah, they're, they're and, to and so the, the soldiers are trying to take the boats of yeah. the ca- of the Catholics because they're yeah. they're uh, yeah they're Catholic in the in the film, and and the son has this kind of um this kind of violent reaction to it. I think just in seeing it, it's the whole thing. It's the like the fact that these guys are going to take the boat, but it's the fact that his father, in his mind, is probably like debasing himself or. Yeah, he's show, letting it show, happen. He's not taking a stand. He's, show, he's showing weakness. Um, yeah, but but it's it's interesting um, that you say that. Uh, like even the way you positioned it, I, I I think it's I think that's an interesting take, and I think there's something there. the The idea that the religion, the family structure, and the you know the society itself, the government is has nothing to offer anyone and there's just and there's really no stability there there's no comfort there um and and while i do think there's probably something there i don't know how far it gets you in explaining why he does what he does because oh I think, yeah no that's what i was gonna cause, say is because i think because I, I think ultimately there is no explanation and no i, I agree yeah, with that yeah like it's it, it just seems you know it, the closest you get to understanding it is that it does seem like just some weird compulsion that he has to do this but uh, exactly and that's that's what i was going to get at actually is i you put this type of person who's prone to do that type of thing and you throw them in a society where they feel this way mm-hmm. and let's just it's like a like an animal loose in this society where there's there is nothing to prevent them from feeling that way kind of thing. yeah like everything around him is failing him and it's not why he's acting through violence, but it's it's a good example of like when he would. Yeah, absolutely, and and also a, a difference between the films is you know in this one you spend most of your time with him or with yeah. people peripherally connected to him, whereas in Castle of Sand it is more of a police procedural, so you spend more time with the cops. Yeah, exactly, um, and, and, and know, that fits because you're you're kind of learning about him and why he did it. it there is more of a, a solid kind of explanation in Castle Sand because it's leading you to some kind of a meaning. The 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 narrative's a little more intricate. The person who ends up doing the killing, like the murder they're trying to investigate, is this kind of famous uh, composer, and but it's quite intricate the way they lay it out because it starts out. They go t- to this town to see if they can find any connection. It was off like the flimsiest of evidence. Literally leads to nothing. They don't, the, and they're cops from Tokyo, you know, that have just spent, you know, department money to travel there and they got to go back now. So they're feeling yeah, kind of, yeah. they're feeling kind of dejected on the train on the way back. And you see the composer. I don't know if you're supposed to think anything of it. Something I noticed on this viewing, uh, the the older cop is saying he would like to go on a trip and spend more time with his son. The moment he says, I want to spend more time with his son is when the composer leans forward and grabs the uh, the ashtray or the drink or whatever off the table. Playing into like the father-son thing later on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which I thought was a really cool detail. It also kind of sets up why the uh, the main detective is so taken with this story. Is he like You never see his kid, but there's kind of a lingering sense of like he misses his family life. Yeah, for sure. This is, again, probably dealing with the humanist aspect of it. I I think in Castle of Sand, like, it's dramatically pretty bleak. It's, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's like a fun movie or anything. No, I wouldn't But, but, but there is a sense of this feeling of some kind of loss or like you say like there's like a longing or a yearning for yeah. something more I, I mean the uh, vengeance is mine it's like these people they're they're like fucking animals like i would just, say like yeah, they're I, just they're just animals like even even the 
the, the you know the closest you have to that kind of yearning is is with the is with his you find out that his father and his wife are like in love with each other yeah and and but they're not doing anything because the father because he's like sees himself as a good catholic is trying to uh, you know suppress his desires um but even that like it it just it feels more like animalistic like even the way he talks about it later with his son at the end of the film when yeah. he's he's talking about how basically like essentially saying i wanted to fuck her but i but i didn't because well, i'm a good catholic it's i think the big difference between the main character and the father is that and this i think this is what's so like icky and like amoral about it is that the father's a hypocrite yeah. He's saying like, "Oh, I'm above this," but then what does he do? He gets somebody else to basically come and have sex with her, and she she succumbs to it because she because he's because she knows he wants her to. Yeah, and it's like this totally fucked up thing that he would have the main character would have just gone and done it, and he's unapologetic about it. He says, "This is just who I am," and these other people they're just as bad as him, really, in their own way. Maybe not quite literally, but you know, kind of metaphorically as bad as him mm -hmm. but but they put up this face or they have this idea that they're above it right and, and but and i think so i i read something that was i thought was kind of an interesting point so uh and this could maybe be a little bit of a springboard to touch on the japanese new wave slightly yeah. but it's i heard somebody i read something where they said um this is to the japanese new wave what touch of evil is to film noir which is that they it's a it's a like summational film and yeah. it kind of chisels the tombstone of that movement it's very much a reaction against the films of like ozu and i know uh, imamura himself was actually an assistant on a few ozu films yeah he worked on tokyo story and he fucking hated yeah. Ozu, like I'm not saying, uh, no, I don't know if he hated him as a person, but he like hated these films, and he was just, yeah. he was just like, this isn't life as I understand it, because he had a bit of a, a sketchy background himself, like before he got into film, like he had a very kind of rough and tumble upbringing, and um, I don't quite know the circumstances that led him to this, but he was a bit of a con artist and things like that in his youth, so the life that he's interested in depicting on film is essentially like, you know, like gamblers and whores. And you know what I mean? The like, wow, that's interesting. Like, you bring that up because um, you said he's a con artist. I found actually with vengeance is mine. The times where like, it's really exciting is when he's posing as like the lawyer. Yeah. He's getting those people to give him the bail money. Right. Yeah. He, like he's pretend he's saying like oh if you give me this bail money I can kind of get your son off and stuff and he just and, books it and, and, take and, and it's fucking and like and the thing is is like he fleeces this old woman yeah of, of a hundred thousand yen yeah that she had saved up to get her fucking son out of prison and he just takes off yeah it's crazy honestly man one of the creepiest fucking things and I I forgot about it when I watched it this time. One of the creepiest things or just like upsetting images I've ever seen in a film is when he's sitting in that lawyer's apartment and the fucking door just swings oh, open yes. and you yes. see the body in there. And it's that just is fucked up. Man, what an image. That's just. And yeah. his his reaction to that disturbing image is annoyance. And he just has to he has to try to close it and tape it up and stuff. There is something morbidly kind of funny about that. Even oh, 100%. It's, yeah, it's yeah. so horrifying that the fact that he handles it in a nonchalant manner. Like, well, if you've ever had a dresser that just never closes, it's like he handles it like that, basically. Well, well, and it's funny, too, because he goes out and he pick, get, gets these supplies. So he's like, give me a hammer, give me nails, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, he comes home with the hammer and nails and some booze. And then he starts like dumping booze on the body and then drinking booze and spitting the alcohol in the air. And you realize it's probably because it fucking reeks. Like it probably, like he's sitting in there with a corpse yeah. that I don't yeah. even know how long the guy's been dead. Yeah. And they do something earlier too in the film where he pisses on his hand to wash away blood and then he grabs fruit and bites into it. 
oh you know and, and he uh, spits it out it's just like this guy he's just so acts on his impulses and they're just these disgusting fucking impulses that he doesn't take into consideration that like the gross reality around it well it's it's actually the thing it's and the thing that's funny about that when he but when he pisses on his hand and bites the fruit yeah is he spits it out and throws it away and he said, I forget exactly what he says, but he's basically like, yeah, nobody's going to like that fruit. It's disgusting without even thinking like, yeah, maybe it's disgusting because you got piss all over <laughs> yes, it. You, exactly. You, yeah. You, you fucking animal. And, and this uh, is immediately following a really disturbing murder scene. So it's like, it's, it's like, it's funny and like darkly comic, but it's not like, like a comedy scene. It's just like, it just adds the sense of just grotesqueness to it. I watched an interview with him after watching vengeance is mine last night and in it like the guy starts talking the guy interviewing him starts asking about the acting um and and he talked about how after prof he had such a miserable experience on profound desires of the gods that he hated actors oh wow really? and that he actually like loathed them and detested them and thought these are just the most kind of loathsome bunch of fucking people and like i oh my god i can't you know he's a wow um, and uh and then it was in working on this film and dealing with these actors um and he had like a really good a good experience um working with them that he realized like oh okay maybe it's not you know Okay, that was probably just like a bad time. Yeah, well, they filmed thing. that film for like eighteen months in like horrible conditions and stuff too, right? I I have to wonder if a lot of it was just like the actors were being hard to work with because they were just so miserable. Um, you know, which like, seems the, to be the case when you watch the film, you get that that sense that it was probably an ordeal to film. Vengeance is mine was a little bit more standard movie production you know yeah. and and the acting i mean it's it's just phenomenal like uh, ken ogata as the as our killer actually yeah that's actually a good point there to um compare the two is ken ogata's in both films and one he's and in vengeance's mind he's kind of the epitome of evil and with castle sand in a way he's kind of the epitome of just good yeah for sure it well it's and it's interesting you know, we got pretty heavy into vengeance. Uh, vengeance is mine. Yeah, which I figured there. we would. Um, just to bring it back to Castle of Sand, so he's the victim, and they find out that the killer is this uh, classical composer that we had mentioned earlier, and the reason he killed him is because essentially they were kicked out or they left the village they were living in because the father had leprosy yeah him and the composer was a little boy and his his father his biological father had was a leper and uh they were kicked out of the village they wander around for two years i believe it says and yeah then, it's a good amount of time and and then they end up in this town where the this guy who would you know be the future victim i guess but played by ken ogata is is a cop there and he tries to help them out yeah and the father gets sent away to a hospital and the, he tries to raise the boy himself but the boy ends up running away it, it's so I, I almost don't want to get bogged down too much but then this happens and this happens yeah it, it's very much indebted to melodrama at a certain point. Oh, absolutely. It I and, would actually say it's it's the most silent film I've ever seen like a 70s film go. In terms of it's it's pretty much just basic human emotion with like this score and you're just seeing actions. You know, there's not really a lot of dialogue in that whole section. It it almost feels like Charlie Chaplin is the kid. I agree. It has that. So I think for me this is maybe a question of I just don't know if this director has the chops the formal chops to pull off what he's trying to pull off here there were times where it just like really wasn't connecting with me or yeah and i think it's kind of one of those things where if you're not a hundred percent with it it would kind of come off a certain way and i i i'm with it like when when that whole section happens i'm just so it's heart-wrenching 
but I can see if you're not with it, like that seeming that way. For me, I think what does it is I think the music is beautiful. The like the the scenery is just gorgeous. So I'm just kind of wrapped up in the like the artistry of it. But then the the face of the leper father is just so like I don't want to use the word pathetic, but just like broken that I just mm. like it just my heart aches for it. And I'm just able to get wrapped up in the whole the whole thing right. and just kind of go with it. And like you used melodrama, it's it's melodramatic as hell. That's the best I, word to, to describe. Yeah, it. I I think. I don't know. I, I, yeah, and I think that's sort of what I'm talking about when I say, um, like you were talking about, like you know, the scenery and all this kind of stuff, and the music, and and I think like scenery looks nice, music's pretty good, but he just, I don't know that he, it's, it lacks something. I, I, you know, it's something I don't even know if I could quite put my finger on what it is. Yeah, but there's some kind of like way that you just have to really be able to pull all that shit together to, to, to to get the like emotional impact that he's clearly going for there that for me anyway i just feel like he can't quite do that yeah uh, I get it does it doesn't quite it doesn't i wouldn't say it's not that it doesn't work for me at all it's just a thing where like I, there was a feeling of slight disappointment in that i felt like this isn't as emotionally powerful as i know it could be but it's still a quite interesting sequence and the thing and the thing that i love about it so i love the fact that you end you basically that's the last like 40 minutes of the film that ends this way so what they do is it comes into this scene where the cops are all congregating yeah and that, yeah, and, 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 okay. and they and they have evidence that you don't you don't even realize they have so he's like, you know, I'm going to lay it out for you. And and it's intercut with our composer, the composer character, playing that song, this this piece that he's written. Yeah. And there's been like, Destiny. you can tell there's been a lot of fanfare. Destiny, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can tell there's been a lot of fanfare and people are eagerly anticipating it. I love the fact that like it takes place in this world where like, classical composers are like fucking rock stars you yeah know? yeah i like that too <laughs> like 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 everybody yeah and he's like and he's got like the sunglasses all yeah. the time and he's like you know he's he in the seems news like, constantly he's like really cool and, yeah 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 and it's like what what fucking way like even in the 70s i can't imagine this was actually the case but the th but the thing is with that that's interesting about it is earlier you were talking about how methodical it is. And I remember I said, it is up to a point and that's yeah. the point. It's not just that it goes in this other direction, but it's that like, they know things that there's no way they could know. Like the police, like it just doesn't make logical sense. Some of the information they have, like, how would you know this? How would you get this? What are you talking about? Like it, 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 it becomes a device at that point, you know, but it works. Like it, I definitely went with it and it's not even something I was really even conscious of until it ended. And I just started thinking about, yeah, and I think the way I think how I kind of view that part of it, cause it completely becomes a different movie in the last. Oh part. yeah. Like I said, it becomes yeah, it becomes yeah. the kid. It's, it goes from memories of murder to the kid. And that's a very weird way to transition i think the way it sets itself up though is because yeah it's it's being told over this like he's been it's been kind of building up him writing this piece right it's like this is the piece he's always been meant to to write literally called destiny so that there's that poetry to it but also the detective himself who's telling the story is mm -hmm. a poet and a dreamer oh that's right yeah yeah so he, he's been writing like, poetry and stuff so i think it's kind of like it, yes logically it doesn't completely add up but i think a part of it is like it's a poetic emotional response rather than a strict police report right and then because he because he gets very moved and, and oh yeah he starts getting choked up like just telling them about it you know to compare the films and you know delving into this kind of terrain because it's like it, it ends in this way where I think there's some kind of transcendence. Yeah, that's a good word for it, actually. Um, whereas Vengeance is Mine ends in this way where it's almost like a fucking sick joke. Where like they're trying to they're trying to throw the bones into the water. Yeah, the I... bones just keep like breaking apart in the air, and 
and just like disintegrating and and it's 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 like it's like the earth doesn't want you know like the earth's like i kind of i kind of took that as uh like like the whole movie like the very first it's kind of going to vengeance his mind a little bit the first scene his very first introduction is him talking about how he's going to die soon yeah and yeah. then the end is his bones like being kind of like just staying in, like basically they're throwing his which is weird it's not even ashes that they're throwing it's uh, fucking yeah, it's, bones yeah yeah and they're throwing these bones and they're kind of staying in the air and to me it's like his soul can never find rest like it's just this inevitable yeah. darkness within him and actually something i kind of want to bring up because i never noticed it i wonder if you noticed it is in i think it's one of the first scenes um after he ki- after he kills the guys like the first two guys when he steals the truck mm-hmm. and he's counting his money um he- he's listening to the radio and he hears them talking about the murders on the radio he he turns on the light beforehand but once they start talking about the murders on the um the radio if you actually look the and this is something I'd never noticed the first viewing, but like it blew me away the second viewing. Right in the foreground, uh, the like the string on the light is it's right in front of him, and it's like a noose. Yeah, you notice that yeah. too. Yeah, I yeah, did. that that I never noticed that the first yeah. viewing. This viewing, I'm just like, oh, it's it's just yeah. there lingering. Like the idea that this guy is just he just has a small amount of time on this earth. Yeah, it's that's true too. I mean, that's that's certainly an aspect of the movie as well it's it's uh it's dealing it is dealing with uh mortality you know and with and with vengeance is mine what you have is like your protagonist is just this agent of chaos and there and 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 there is no order there is no structure and that kind of follows in the narrative, but it's just very chaotic and it's just all over the place. And, um, and whereas I think in Castle of Sand, you have, uh, you know, cause I mean, the police are always going to represent some kind of order. And I think the fact that it focuses in on this investigation, it, it does kind of act as an organizing principle for the narrative, you know, and and, it, and it's it's a little more straightforward in that way. Even oh, though absolutely, even though at the end it kind of like it it does kind of go off in this weird direction. But even then, like it's very easy to follow, and you know what's going on. It's yeah. like you yeah. understand what's happening, and 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 it's it's just it's just strange that a police procedural would transform into this yeah that's narrative. What, that that's yeah. what's weird about it yeah but in in a, in a plot sense it's it's very straightforward and you you get what's happening and you're yeah like there's no there's no real confusion there no not at all um, it's just it's the style of it. it's not the fact that because it makes sense you you get the police procedural where they're following the clues and then you find out who the killer is and then you get the explanation of how the killer got to that point that's pretty standard it's the fact that it's told in this melodrama silent film yeah weird heart wrench i think the the emotion i would use to describe what it's going for and it works for me is heart wrenching which right. is this heartbreaking story of a father and son like it could have been a short film like you almost could take away the rest of the movie and that could just be its own piece i well it's it's interesting to i guess to stick with this kind of thread of of you know order and chaos because i think also what happens when, when you focus in on the cops is that you have people who are using logic and reason to understand something. And ultimately they are able to understand. Yeah. It. That's a good but, point. You know, there is a sense of like order restored at the end to a certain extent, whereas in vengeance is mine. It's like, you can't understand this like the closest we maybe get to some kind of understanding is it, but again, it still seems unconvincing is when the father tells him, you know, essentially like you won't kill me because you only kill people that haven't hurt you. Essentially that like what you've done are like proxy murders that I'm really the one you want to kill, but you can't. So you just take it out on these other people. Yeah, and they actually kind of sum that up in another scene too, where he's talking with the the like the housekeeper's mother. 
who also has committed a murder. He actually ends up living with another person who's committed a murder. And she says, like, oh, yeah, I think you're the same as me, but it's but we're not because you haven't killed the one you want to kill. That's yeah, that's right. And 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 that might even be true that, you know, the this psychological analysis, but I still don't think it explains everything like i don't know i don't think it's it's, yeah i don't think it does at all it it it, and it's this feeling of this lack of of resolution nothing's resolved whereas in castle of sand i mean ultimately the ending while tragic is emotionally satisfying yeah definitely Um, it there's there's an emotional resolution where it's bittersweet because you have like there's mixed feelings like now you feel like the the detective feels okay. I understand where this guy is coming from. What he did, like they still he still goes to jail and stuff. It's not like they're they're so bleeding heart they look the other way or some stupid shit like that, right? Like right. like he still murdered this guy for really no good reason. But you understand like the tragedy of his life getting to that point, and that it gives you an emotional conclusion. Whereas Vengeance is mine, it it doesn't provide that. And I think I actually think that's why I, if I had to pick, I would prefer Vengeance is mine because it has that like. I think it really captures the the essence. There's more truth to it. I, I think you're right, and I probably ag- I would agree. I mean, obviously, I prefer Vengeance is mine. Yeah, for sure. But but I, but I think in a way with Castle of Sand, I mean, the murder is almost at a certain point. It's almost besides besides the point. Like it's just like a vehicle. Like I know what you mean when you say that you could almost have the last forty minutes just be its own like short film, yeah, about it's, this father and son because yeah. it almost feels like the whole movie was just one big long, you know, fucking MacGuffin. Yeah, to, it really does. To, it's so to, to, weird to, to really kind of push you in to this story of this father and son. Like it's all been building, you know, to this story of this father and son. And and there's something about this movie that's a little bit strange, and I I, I can't figure out if it's intentional or not, because I think because the film ends in a way that's almost like so sentimental that I have to think it's unintentional. There is this way that it like sets up that like like this guy beyond the fact that he murders this man is absolutely despicable oh yeah the way to to this woman yeah uh, who ends up dying of a miscarriage and and then like we're just kind of like and it's kind of horrible and quite heart-wrenching and like difficult to watch and and then it's kind of just discarded with and we don't really go back to it and like he mentions it offhandedly in his briefing to the other police officers but it's just kind of this like yeah whatever oh but the poor guy and he had to go yeah, with his no, father I- so so there's like these little moments like that where i feel like they're like throwing in these fucked up things for like maybe genre reasons or something but it's not really dealt with like, like, if something like that was in Vengeance's mind, I would assume, yeah, this is very intentional, and he knows well, what he's doing. Actually, he does do it in Vengeance's mind. He, the same thing happens, because the woman he kills at the end is pregnant. Well, they think oh, she's pregnant. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, so in both yeah. cases, the killer actually... Uh, Although in Vengeance's mind, he literally murders her yeah, in, and, in and, Castle and, Sand. In his defense, in quotation marks, because what he does is fucking disgusting. He doesn't actually murder her. He doesn't know that it happens. But I no, think no. I think the idea, and I actually agree with you, that is a criticism I have of Castle Sand too. I think that whole thing, because I think that sequence is so powerful that you can't forget you can't forget about it when you're at yeah. that end. Because that was like, the up until that point, that was the most raw, visceral, like, actually, I think in the whole film, that's the most, like, bleak part is watching that woman you know having the miscarriage it's fucking disturbing it's unsettling it, it's completely just awful um but i think the idea that they're trying to get at is the idea that like he has a weird relationship with like like fatherhood or carrying on a legacy or something like that because the whole like yeah he feels like he has that relationship with his own father who he doesn't want to see and that causes him to lash out at this person who took on the father role for him I right. Think, I feel like that's what they were probably trying to get at, but I agree with you. That is one element. I think that's one of two elements of the movie. I think don't quite work. I think it's that that scene is delving into something 
that the rest of the film isn't really interested That's exactly in it. dealing with. So it just feels very off. Yeah, whereas I like, completely agree. Where, whereas like Vengeance is mine, even though in a like in a plot sense, it's much more scattered. This is a film that is constantly hammering home this point that like this this life is brutal you know there's no warmth there's no you know like everything's broken uh lazy like you you put quite nicely at the beginning of our our talk the you know the the family religion all these things that would provide people some sense of meaning or comfort are just gone and obliterated i mean the aspects of it that still exist are just completely corrupted and like deformed and uh, they're just they're not working the way they should and so not only is he depicting a world where that's going on but he's depicting a world in which you know potentially you could make the argument that he's almost saying like the only sane response to this is to do what he did that like he's just doing what everyone else doesn't have the guts to do or so you know yeah, in a way, you, i don't know if, it, if i'd go that far i mean it, it's but probably, it, probably taking it a bit far but i think <laughs> yeah, but, but i think I, it's the inevitability of it of yeah. like of course this is going to happen and i think that's kind of plays into that character actually with um with vengeance is mine we were talking about how uh castle of sand kind of and you know there's a, like a sentimental edge to it mm-hmm. with um vengeance is mine i think the whole film is it's it's almost told objectively, kind of like it's it's very much kind of away from the characters. It shows the actions and it sure. shows the consequences. With Vengeance is Mine, I think one of the parts that I think struck me the most on this viewing was there is one moment that feels kind of subjective, and it's when he comes home to the family after I think it's after he's released from prison the first time and he's remarried and he he basically calls out the the father in law and the uh, or no, sorry his father and uh, his wife on their affair and he's just like wrecking shit up and he stomps out and then the father and the daughter-in-law kind of comfort each other mm-hmm. and you see this from the from a frame within the frame and it's a window and you see the the sick mother watching it so for a second because the whole yeah. film we're observers and now we're watching someone else who's an observer but we have the luxury of being disconnected from the situation she's in the situation so suddenly it just takes on this whole other element of just wow the 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 immorality of what they're doing the implications come so real in that moment and actually there's this other interesting moment towards the end where it's after it's when he's going upstairs to kill the innkeeper the mother and he starts walking up the stairs and all of a sudden you see his mother walk into frame and walk down the hall and all of a sudden you realize that you're not in the you're not with him anymore you're actually in his house and she walks into the to the room um, oh yeah with the family where, with the family because she's gotten out of the hospital but it's it's interesting that you hit on that because the mother uh the innkeeper's mother is a voyeur as well and that yes. plays out that's a very good point. I didn't that even think play, of that. That yeah. that plays out quite a bit. Yeah. And there's this thing where like they keep calling um prostitutes to come uh sleep with their their guests that are staying at the inn. Yeah. And eventually they don't want to come anymore because they're like, Your mother creeps us out. Yeah, she's just very <laughs> off putting, like you're, you're having sex and yeah. you look over and she's just like you see her little eyes peeking in. So. Yeah, yeah. It's so fucking weird. You find out that like the husband of the innkeeper put the mother up to peeping and and then it almost seems like it's gonna go in this weird like bonnie and clyde direction and then he just murders her in this very oh, yeah uh, it's strange again like just like this compulsion it's just yeah, like it's, it's just I think that's, like i think that's a big part of it is the idea that these people do exist in real life and there are these little elements of their lives that you can kind of piece together but ultimately it leads nowhere and it's just it's just i think it's it's in a way it's kind of a nature over nurture kind of thing where you you can criticize the nurture all you want but it's in this guy's nature that's probably a good way of putting it. Like, ultimately, you can't understand it. And I think the moment where you realize that you really can't understand this guy 
is like you feel i think he genuinely has some feeling for this person then ultimately for reasons that i couldn't even begin to explain and i don't think the film even tries he just decides no okay i'm just gonna strangle you now yeah exactly actually we were talking about with him having feelings towards her because i think he has a genuine affection towards his mom and i was talking about earlier how there is yeah. that subjective moment actually there is a subjective moment another subjective moment which is when she, they're in the theater and she first finds out it's him and they're kind of walking through the busy streets and she's now aware that he's the mm. person on the run i actually get really into her point of view in there it's like it's very suspenseful like what do you do in that situation this person this university professor that you're start it seems like you're starting to fall for like you said it almost seems like, a, like they're setting up a bonnie and clyde thing where she falls for the guy but she accepts him despite his crimes um but when she first finds that out like it's very intense scene actually my heart was like pounding i was like oh my god like what would you do in that moment yeah it's such a yeah like you said like overall it's it's objective like he punctuates these couple of little moments yeah of, of where he gives you something subjective but ultimately this is closer to real life, yeah and i think know? what it what it does differently than most movies that try to exist because this is it's not just a like figuring out like well following the serial killer it's the movie about where the main character is a serial killer and i think what it does differently is it it provides you those easy explanations but it also provides those moments that contradict them well because everybody the thing is is like everybody has shit like exactly like like any of us like it, like if any of us like being who we are right now if any one of us went on a fucking rampage and got arrested and people started pouring through our history and our lives, they would find things that would be yeah. like, oh, that it makes sense that they did this. Exactly. A, a bunch or, of easy it's, answers. It's, yeah. Like it would be, you know, it, it, everybody has these things. And, and, and it's just like, and this film is really about, I mean, in a way, this is really a film about how senseless it all is. Yeah. That, like, I, I, this, I think that's the heart of the film. It's, I think it's just main. Yeah, yeah, like, it's just, this is absolutely senseless. I mean, the way he gets into it seems senseless. I, like, he's just like, yeah, I guess I'm just gonna kill these guys. Take their truck, I guess. Yeah. Like, it just, it seems so fucking arbitrary, like. I think the way it's told where it's, it's throw, it throws everything out, it feels like that's going to lead, like, oh, we're just getting a glimpse of this, and then we're gonna get an explanation later. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't provide that. It's just, like, it is just as senseless as everything else. Every moment of his life, when you take it out of context, it seems senseless. But when you throw it all in context and mix it up, it continues that, that uh, narrative that there is no point to any of this. If you arranged it in a certain order, you might be able to try to like edit it into seeming like there's some sort of reason to it. Right. But when you throw it all over the place like the film does, it just adds to that sense of just like what you said earlier, chaos. Well, and and even the title is 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 kind of interesting because mm. it's it's you know because it's like vengeance is mine, which of course is uh, you know biblical. Yeah. Um. It, it's almost. It's not a joke exactly but it, it it but like the title itself almost acts as this weird red herring when i saw it the first time i expected to be like to expected to have like some kind of drive and uh and, and you know but then you watch it you know the film runs cold right it doesn't really run hot the the things that are happening within it hot emotions and and strong passions and and of course there's a, you know a certain amount of of bloodletting it's always almost always at this kind of remove and it's all very kind of dispassionate and it is almost like the god's eye view yeah and so i was like, just, i was about to get to that because because it's called vengeance is mine and in the bible quote yeah mine is god that's right? god yeah, yeah. That, exactly yeah. and when he i think i think it's when he it's either when he murders her or when he's dealing with after he's murdered her the the landlady it's actually shot from a god's eye view yeah so, that's right so this it's like his own punishment is like it's like this this thing that's within him to this compulsion causes him to kind of like destroy the one part of humanity he may have been may have been attached to and that's maybe you know i don't think it's literally like that's god's vengeance on him no, no but it's that idea of an object like he's just in an objective sense he's getting his comeuppance in a way like he's he's getting he's suffering as a result of his own actions yeah ab absolutely it's it, i mean it's it's uh it's a remarkable film I, I i'm definitely 
it, it, it feels very unpleasant, you know, like it's all very, uh, it, he, he doesn't, he doesn't indulge in any of that, like, uh, movie-ish kind of stuff that would make it exciting or, uh, no, it, he doesn't at all. Actually, after the first two murders, which happened really early in, you don't really even see much of that sort of thing. No, and 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 even those murders are very like, uh, you know, like it's very kind of sloppy, and it's, it's oh yeah, very, it's fighting back. It's very and it's very like it's like hard to watch because like, like one guy's like like saying like no, don't kill me, and like. Yeah, I have a like, daughter. You know, like my daughter. Yeah, yeah, my daughter needs me, and it's all you know. It's oh, all very it's like it's it's very like hard to watch and 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 quite disturbing. It's it's not an exploitation film. It's not made to be exploitative. No, um, I agree. I mean, for a film, I mean, you gotta think too. This is a film that's filled with. We haven't even talked about that aspect of it. Is that this character is like got an endless sexual appetite. And oh yeah. No sexual scene in this film is remotely erotic or or appealing in any way. It's just it's uncomfortable, it's it's gross, it's violent. Mm. It's just it's very animalistic in a very barbaric actually honestly just as nihilistic as the violence is the portrayal of sexuality in the film. Not just from the main character but from everyone. It's either inappropriate or it's paid for or there's some sort of disconnect or it's straight up ag aggressive. He definitely has this view of people that they're that are they're base. He's really getting into the hypocrisy of people who are base like this and they try to cover it up or obscure it through these other means. So in the case of the father, it's religion. Who's great. All the acting in this is, is, oh, it's fantastic. is, is great across the board. Like, um, yeah, the, the cast is just quite flawless. And he's just, he's really good at casting like memorable people. Like that lawyer that he kills like he's yeah, such a, he's such a weird looking guy. You yeah, know? and his like face he when he's such... in the trunk. Yeah. And if it was a normal looking person, I don't think it would be as startling. It's almost that uncanny valley effect. Like, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen? You've seen Black Sabbath, right? The film. Uh, I have. Yeah. You know the, the third section, the, the 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 drip of water part, where there's uh, the, the, yeah. the woman in the bed. It's kind of that kind of effect where it's such a strange image that it's just it's star it's startling. Because you don't expect to see something like that. Like it's it's yeah. it's close to real life, but just slightly off enough. And I yeah. think that actor having that distinctness to him really enhances that shock. Because you just it just comes out of nowhere. And and there's a, there's an interesting uh, thing that happens as well. Like this kind of he goes to the inn probably about halfway through the movie. He gets this prostitute the, to you know to come over the first night. And so this woman, this woman comes over, you know, for the night. Yeah. And then you see her later and she sees him on TV and she's like, that's him. Like, that's the guy, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, I spent, all, I spent and, all night with him. I recognize him. Yeah. And, but there's this aspect where she kind of ends up being the only moral person in the movie because even though like by societal standards like she's the you know she's the one who's kind of looked down upon because she's a prostitute yeah but but in a way she's kind of the only one who seems to have any kind of moral conscience at all because she obviously is like oh i should tell the police and i was like nah, i don't fucking tell the police like jesus what are you thinking and, yeah when she first brings up know, the idea they say like oh the, the police won't listen to you or they will like they don't like our kind and, and we don't want yeah just we don't want that trouble and and so she kind of just leaves it and then plus like she's like well maybe it's not him i don't know you know if in that situation you would probably be easily convinced to like yeah we'll just forget it yeah and then and then you see her again at the end and she sees him and she's about to go tell the police and then she's like no yeah, maybe she has I second won't. thoughts on it but then she's like no i'm going to and then she like runs 
to the police and then yeah that's a good point i didn't think of it at the time but now that you're mentioning it her being kind of like the the one moral light in the film it's not that she doesn't have those base selfish desires is that she actually overcomes it you literally see her make the decision i don't she wants to run away from this but she says you know what i have to face this and she yeah. makes the decision and, to go and, you know and, and it's and it's definitely a situation where I, I don't think it's meant, uh, you know, I certainly don't think like, oh, there we go. So now the film's hopeful because it's not no, at it's all. Not at all. And, no, not I mean, because it's literally like out of everybody in this movie, there's like this one person, literally one person who has like a little bit of work. Because even like, like the wife and and the father, like, you know, it's not a question of like, them betraying him or anything they're so self-interested it's pretty fucked up like it's like like even though there's an aspect where you're almost like almost rooting for them to be like oh well hopefully they get together anyway but then you think about it, you're like what no like what is wrong with these people and like, yeah it's <laughs> funny you should say that because the first time i watched this actually we had a conversation about this film forever ago and I talked about how one of my favorite scenes was when they're in the hot tub and they kind of, they're both kind of so, I kind of thought of them as victims. Like I was like, they're so just in a world of their own because of the, all this horrible things that this main character has done. That they kind of succumb to a passion between them. Yeah. It's almost the opposite of that. It's that like their hypocrisy to like deflect their actual inner selves. Yeah. They're, they're completely complicit in their feelings. It's not because anything to do with him. They felt this way before when the, the mother is kind of like hesitant towards her and, and he's hesitant towards her at first too. It's because that attraction's there from the beginning. It has oh, nothing 100%. to do with the son. Because he that says he's being a little bit harsh and talking about like what a jackass his son is or whatever. And then, uh, and then he's and he makes the point of saying it's nothing against this woman or you know whatever right like he kind of makes the point of saying like you know it's on a first viewing you can kind of see it as like well he's just being nice or whatever yeah he's just like it's you not know, yeah but on the second viewing it takes a whole different it, it, you realize that it like immediately that's almost like his unconscious desires coming out where he's yeah. just like, you know, don't get me wrong. I want to fuck this chick. Yeah. But I'm yeah, just, yeah you know, she's fine as hell, but she's not, yeah, what no, we're, just, we're looking for, you know, but we Buddhist around here or whatever. Cause she's Buddhist. I think at the, beginning, yeah. like she, she converts to converts for Catholicism, him, yeah. but, but she's, she's a Buddhist. At the and that beginning. plays into his hypocrisy too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And like, and there's something so, it's th this thing where he says, you know, you've been excommunicated and, oh, you know, I decided that I should be excommunicated too because you're my son. Or it's just like, it's like, oh, fuck off, you fucking martyr. Like, go, like, it yeah. just, like, yeah, you just, it's, it's such a, like, self-pitying, like, like, you know that it's not, it's not based on any real. It's self-pity dressed up as selflessness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's a very, yeah. I mean, it's a very, it's interesting too. Like the more, the more I think about it, the more complex the characters seem. I mean, I'm certainly open to like, these are just this conversation we're having right now. These are just kind of my thoughts as I see it right now. Like, actually, I know I've literally experienced that on the first viewing. I was more with them. I think I was too. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I feel I, like, and I feel like it's because you're so disgusted with that main character that even a character like that seems okay. But once you're kind of, I don't want to say you're used to him, but once you know what the film's going after with that character, then the, the stuff with the other characters is like, okay, I kind of see what he's going for here. It's, it's, it's not just this one character who's the problem. It's, mm. it's this worst problem in the, set, in, in the middle of all this well, horrible shit. Well, and, and you see it again, like talking about uh, the aspect of the film that's a, that, that deals with the kind of family structure. It's not just his family, but the family relationship between the innkeeper and her mother yep. is, is, is fucking beyond belief. Yeah. It's depraved beyond belief. Yeah. Like what's going on there. It's the, the it's, mother's it's, sick. She's forcing her, she's forcing a marriage on her as well. Kind of like his family. Yeah. Same, the same kind of thing it, where it's, it's a parent forcing their child into a marriage for their own benefit. 
right yeah, yeah. And, and projecting their own ideas onto it honestly like you were saying the prostitute was like the one moral light the, the closest thing to a a um a functional family unit is that surrogate family unit of the prostitutes in the brothel or whatever yeah, they're, they're in. yeah like you like, exactly like you only see them briefly but you get the sense that like yeah this is functional yeah. exactly and i think part of that too what that plays into is the idea that they like those characters they they they're like what normally society would kind of look the other way on but they're people who are very upfront i will exchange sex to you there's no there's no apologies there's no face there's no facade there's no masquerading at all it's just pure honesty and I think that's kind of because I think what he's playing with a lot in the film is that idea of what we want and how we and what we want to want. Yeah. What we actually desire and what we want others to perceive us to um, aspire to. It's it's a very rich text. And, and it's, it really it's is. This, it's this seemingly straightforward story, but it's not like a straight line, you know? Yeah, like no, it's, it's it's almost like it's zooming in because it's like, yeah, like on on a surface level, he's on he's on a manhunt. He's running away. He's he's, you know, putting on disguises. He's he's trying to hide. But it shows the daily life part of that a little bit, too. Like he kind of yeah. he kind of gets situated as the professor character. Like he yeah. doesn't just pull it off as a Connor. He kind of gets into that that world, and he, and he doesn't just he doesn't play it totally where he's just completely acting different. He still he still acts on his his urges and stuff like that. But it's um it's not just that like oh you're seeing him hiding and he's always constantly on alert and stuff like. At a certain point, you would get used to the idea that you're hiding, and like as the situations present themselves, like when that that guy comes to have him put up the poster, and he hands the poster to him. I, I love that. That's oh, great. I love that scene so much. That's and he so just rips, And he just rips it up, and he's just very nonchalant. Oh, it's a poster he wants me to put up, and he he, he doesn't rip it up, but he like folds it up and puts it in his pocket. I, and I think that's an aspect they don't make like a huge deal out of it, but I think that's an aspect of the film that's kind of interesting too. Is it's just. It's just this idea that, like, if there's a manhunt for the, this guy who's a wanted murderer, you just wouldn't think he was standing right in front of you. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, you just you just wouldn't think that. Like, like even the cop is just like, oh, obviously, this is a different guy. He kind of looks like him, but I'm sure it's yeah, a different guy. He, he you probably, know didn't even, I mean? probably didn't even think about it. And actually, it's funny because that kind of plays into that scene in uh, Castle Sand, too, where they're trying to think of, like, find this murderer. And he literally, like, walks by and he, he grabs a cup in front of them. Like, that idea that, like, you're, you yeah. just would never expect it. I mean, it's a very different case because there's no, unless you're psychic, you're not going to be able to pick up on that in the You train, wouldn't know. Yeah, Castle yeah. Sand, Vengeance is mine. It's literally, he's holding a picture of the guy and handing it to him but it's that same kind of irony yeah well and i think what well, i think it's also it and 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 in, in vengeance is mine it probably plays into this idea of like the people immersed in this society can't see the evil you know like he can't see the evil that's standing right and like literally right in front of him and uh yeah it's uh it's like i said it's a fantastic film but it's uh you know, so I think there's like a certain mysteriousness to just like, what's the point of this? Almost, you know, yeah. like not not in a bad way, but no, just, in a great way. I think that's exactly the strength way. of it. Yeah, yeah. but it's. I mean, what what do you think of like what when somebody just murders someone? It it is pointless. And the film really taps into that by by being a film. Not that the you walk away from the film thinking that was pointless, but you walk away from it thinking, what did that mean? And I think. I think that really captures that, and I think that's I think that's why it is a better film than Castle of Sand overall. Mm. I, I love Castle of Sand. I think that it's it's a great film in its own way. But in terms of if you're going to approach a film with the subject matter, I mean, Vengeance is Mine is one of those films where it just takes it to the next level. Oh yeah, that's. I mean, it's um, you know, you watch this and then you watch like a Hollywood serial killer kind of film and yeah i mean you would almost just like i like i like i don't think i could watch one right now i I'm, i would need to have a little bit of distance whether that's a, whether it's accurate or not it feels like the truth yeah it feels, I, I think you just it, it, hit it. it it feels like the kind of unvarnished reality of what it means to take a life for somebody to kill people and, and and what it means and and realistically i think the power of the film lies in the fact that he stares the truth in the face which is like it doesn't mean anything 
yeah exactly there is there is no meaning like what what meaning are you hoping to find here it's like it's it's a horrible thing that happened that's it that's all it means yeah and uh, maybe if you were like somebody who was actually in those experiences or you you know on either end of it it would have a different meaning for you but as people who've you know i mean we don't we have an experience that we're, we're an, you know an audience member observing an interpretation through art the idea of it being senseless is really how we're we're bound to feel about it like yeah. the, like the the fact that people go and murder people for their own gain or for whatever reason it feels senseless it's like the, the end of a life for no reason and the film really captures that yeah abs absolutely and and there's this way when he kills people in the film but especially when he kills the innkeeper I mean, there's something, her reaction to it is very, like, she can't believe it. She barely even struggles, because, and she just has this look of, like, this isn't something that happens to me. This is yeah. something that happens to other people. And, 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 it, and I, and the murders with the, uh, the guys at the beginning kind of capture that somewhat, too. Yeah, with them, it's, it's like an animal that's, like, being put down, and it's just struggling for its last breath. It's doing anything to... To yeah. survive, and I like that they keep, like they're like he's fi they're fighting for their lives so strongly. And the guy at the end is like saying like, oh, you know, or the second guy. I mean, sorry, not the guy at the end. This in the end of that sequence where he kills the two guys. The second, yeah, yeah. He says like, oh, I have a daughter and stuff. And they're fighting, and this is like this is their life. That's everything. Everything you know, it's the most meaningful thing. It's their life, and it's so meaningless to the killer that when he goes and buys the knife, you see him buy it, and he goes for the cheaper one. He's like, I oh, like it doesn't matter. That's by the cheaper one. Yeah, he says, ah, the cheaper one will do. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it's that's... just so pointless to him. Like, it's so, like, it doesn't have any weight to it. That, like, why would he spend the extra money? And it's yeah. just such a, it's such a, I mean, it's, it literally makes sense. Like, why would he spend the extra money? But it just says so much about his, his psychology, you know, and where he's yeah. coming from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I guess you've been, I guess you've been going for a while now. So yeah, Jesus, I, mostly, but Vengeance is mine, which I expected when I, when I rewatched Vengeance is mine, I was like, okay, we're going to talk about Castle Sam for a little bit, but this is going to be the fucking, the meat of it. Well, you know, I mean, next time, if you pick a better fucking movie, you know, maybe if I don't throw my, uh, my melodrama propaganda <laughs> on you. <laughs> yeah. And that seems about as good a time as any to, uh, to call it quits, I'd say. Um, so what are we going to be watching, uh, for the next episode? Uh, next episode, we're going to be watching Michael Mann's 2006 Miami Vice and Harmony Corinne's 2012 Spring Breakers. Um, the connection or the link being that they're both poetic crime films set in Florida. Awesome. Well, there we go. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Ciao.